All right. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to the Boca Photography Podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Holritz. It's good to have you here today. For those of you that may be live streaming, it is Friday, so TGIF, right? Happy Friday to everybody, and i um, glad to have you here. And I hope that you'll take advantage of the opportunity as you are live streaming today to engage with us, ask us questions, comment. You can send us funny emojis if you want to but don't be shy. That's the benefit of these live streams is that you get to take advantage of that opportunity to have conversation with myself and certainly with a brand new guest, which I'm gonna introduce here in just a second. This show is produced by Photographers Edit. For those of you that are getting ready to get into busy season, portrait photographers, wedding photographers, make sure that you check out photographersedit.com to outsource your editing. We are custom post-production for the wedding and portrait photographer. All right, on that note, I get to introduce Mary, I have to say a longtime friend. I know we haven't even talked in a little while, but I've just, yeah. I've known you and Justin for so long. So it just feels like longtime friends haven't talked, chatted for a little bit, but we actually get to reconnect through the podcast today. And I appreciate you coming to do the show. It really means a lot. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, 2006, 2006 was the first year that we met, which I'm sure we'll talk about some more. Um, I feel like the last, I don't know. I want to, I just feel like 2020, 2021, 2022 and right up until today is like do over time like yeah. you know any of that time you know it's just sort of like I feel like everybody's like coming re-emerging and reconnecting um but yeah 2006 was the very first time we met you guys um you know yeah, we at, at were... the time for anybody that, that doesn't have the context um my partner at the time and myself business partner and life partner at the time Amber super talented photographer still an active photographer to this day actually um, she and I were pretty heavily involved, not just as wedding photographers and portrait photographers, but in the industry. And we spent quite a bit of time at conferences. Was that, did we meet first at the Pictage conference? Pictage Partner Con Chicago. Chicago. Okay, cool. I don't know cool. if you remember, they did like a one-off in Chicago. Um, we had, or maybe, you know what? It might've been actually spring of 2007. Okay. I think we went to our first conference in LA 2006 and then I think like May of 2007. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you guys were speaking, you were these huge deals and uh, we <laughs> won a mentoring session with you. We won a mentoring session with you. Yes. And you were so kind to us. We like hung out in the lobby uh, of the hotel and you just like poured into us for hours and hours and I'll never ever forget that. Hmm. It means a lot that you bring that up, uh, and I'll try not to get super emotional like here, but honestly, the, the, the biggest reason for this podcast on my part, and a bit ironically, but it just kind of is what it is with life. After Amber and I split, it's been 10 years, over 10 years ago, I kind of yeah. pulled back from the industry, uh, just kind of dealing with my own stuff. Like It was in my head quite a bit, and I was trying to, honestly, I just needed to grow up quite a bit, so I needed to sort through some things, and I wasn't as active in the industry, so when I started Boca, it was, it was an opportunity to get reconnected to the industry through conversation, and what you described yeah. there uh, is super intentional in that we love connecting. I love connecting with photographers, and if possible, to add some value in the process. Um, yeah. But that type of one-on-one -on -one or two-on-two, -two, that conversation is my favorite, favorite thing. And so selfishly, I do this podcast and now we get to reconnect and, and through this format. Yeah. And that's always been your heart. And I just, I love that you're doing this. And um, I can't even imagine how many people tune in every week or, or however often. And just like you, people that you won't even know until, you know, what is it like 17 years later? And I'm like, remember that time in the <laughs> lobby when you super poured into us? Um, like, I just don't think you understand the impact of that. And mm. even in real time. Mm. That means a lot. Thank you very much. And yeah. it's encouraging to hear and, and then exciting that we get to, like you said, kind of hit the reset button and we're both bringing different perspectives to this conversation now, significantly, drastically different perspectives to this conversation than what we had 16, 17 years ago, which is crazy to say mm. out loud. Um, we, yeah. we both learned a lot and we're going to delve into that here in just a second. For anybody listening in who doesn't know Mary, I'm going to go ahead and pop this up on screen too for you. Mary Marantz, M-A-R-Y-M-A-R-A-N-T-Z.com. You probably spend a lot of time spelling your name out, don't you? <laughs> so much and, and pronouncing it. So it's Marantz like dance. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it, see, that's a great way. And, and my last name being Holritz, I don't meet a lot of people with the last name that has T-Z on the end. Um, yeah. We can we can share that. That's something yeah. we have in common. But yeah, I end up having to create some type of frame of reference for people, even though it's like phonetically, it's not actually that complicated to pronounce whole Ritz. I usually go with the Ritz crackers reference exactly. just <laughs> yeah. because they, they can understand that. So anyway, Mary 
bookofrance.com and uh, the same thing on Instagram. Of course, we'll link to this in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. I'll pop this up on screen really quick. And Mary, maybe just as kind of a, a brief introduction, we don't normally do formal introductions here on the podcast, but can you just give our listeners a brief summary of what you're up to right now? You're, you're an active photographer and of course have been photographing for years, but what else are you up to? Yeah, I feel like just for the context of this conversation, I'll give you kind of like the elevator version of my life's movie. And so that is, I grew up right here in this trailer. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see that. For those of y'all who are watching live, you can see the trailer I grew up in. Justin actually took that photo the first time I brought him home to meet my family. Yeah. Um, born and raised in this trailer on a mountain in West Virginia, very rural then go to Yale for law school, as you do, and then become a wedding photographer, which is a really expensive way to become a wedding photographer. I don't recommend that path exactly, um, but we have really good contracts. And we built our business together from 2006. We went full time to really 2019. I ended up, you know, we, we felt like we had just gotten that business where we wanted it to. So it was time to pivot yet again. Yeah. And I signed a book deal to write uh, at least five books with my publisher. Wow. And so I've been doing that for the last, uh, f almost four years, which is crazy. And that's what I mean. Like the last few years, it's just like a blur and it's been really just one very long year, <laughs> I feel like. Uh, but yes, that, and I host a podcast called the Mary Morant show and speaker coach. We have a bunch of courses. That's, that's pretty much, that's the, that's the gist of now. It's it's become and you guys were in this you have been in it for for many years now but it's certainly become a pretty popular thing to get into the education space you know be yeah. a photographer now I'm going to launch a course I'm going to go into some type of education but I'm curious for you what what is the driving motivation behind kind of making that pivot and certainly not only f focusing on education maybe for creators or photographers but you know especially with this book deal and I didn't realize it was five books that's incredible yeah. <laughs> like what's the motivation what's the driving factor behind all of that. Well, for the book side, um, I'll start with that. I have wanted to be an author since I was five. That has always been the dream. That has always been the path. That has always been the plan. And uh, I'm thinking of like the the Chicks song, uh, Long Way Round, you know, like, um, <laughs> you know, it, we, we, we went way out here to get back on the path. But I, yeah. I genuinely am not making that up. I, I remember being about five. There was a very famous author named Pearl Buck from the 1930s who grew up not far from where I did. We would drive past her house all the time. And I just felt like standing in the yard outside that trailer, you know, my faith is really important to me. I felt like God had said to me, you know, this is all not going to be wasted. This muddy, this broken, this beautiful, I'm going to put words to it and it's going to make sense. And so I sort of always in the deepest part of my, you know, like the deepest part of your knower, as they say, I knew where we were headed, but, and we'll probably get into a lot of this, it's so easy to get in your head about things and to get stuck with things and to feel like an imposter and, you know, to, to think it has to be perfect before you can even begin. And so I knew it when I was five, but I actually released my first book when I was 40. So <laughs> slow growth equals strong roots, which is the name of the second book. Uh, it, it's a, it's a, it's something I live out. <laughs> well, we are going to dig into that in, in quite a bit of detail, actually. So everybody listening and you have context here and it's certainly a relevant conversation to, the photography industry and culture. Uh, we'll get there in just a second. Mary, do me a favor if you can and turn up gain just a little bit or maybe have Justin doing that if, if he's doing that. If you can turn up volume up on, volume up on your end, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I will do that. I'm just going to yell for a second. We're super professional here. For like oh, no, that's good. Yeah, yeah. So I'll just give a little holler. Hey, Jay, can we get a little more gain for the low talker? And, and for those of you that are live streaming, again, don't be shy. Say hello, comment, ask questions. Um, Sue says hello from Sun Valley, Idaho. Hey, Sue, thanks for chiming in again. Really appreciate you so consistently showing up for these live streams. And um, we're going we're gonna to get into kind of this first, uh, really kind of an introductory question. I, I've done different things, Mary, over, over the years as far as the format of the show. At the end of the day, the podcast, aside from what I explained earlier, my primary intention was just add value. Right. Um, yeah. it's, we can talk all day long, but I feel like if I'm not in some way adding value to our listeners lives, especially with the limited time that they have, then I'm doing them a disservice. So adding mm. value is number one. But the focus when it comes to adding value is on helping photographers build sustainable businesses, i.e. Yeah. 
build a business. You got to put a lot of work and time and effort and energy into that. But at the end of the day, we, we're our own bosses so that we can have some freedom and flexibility as well. So kind of a both and scenario. Let's put the work in. Let's build really great businesses. But let's do so in a way that's sustainable, i.e. it doesn't burn us out. We still have some freedom and flexibility. We don't have to sit in front of this crazy device or the crazy device in front of me. The devices all the time. We can get out and do something different. And uh, so on that note, just to give a bit of context, on that note, I'm curious for you, and Justin as well, managing different brands and, and entrepreneurial efforts. What yeah. is kind of the driving principle that enables you all to maintain some level of freedom and flexibility as entrepreneurs? Yeah. Well, first of all, how does this sound? Do you want a little more gain or does that feel good? It's actually perfect. Yeah. That's as good. Perfect. Perfect. Great, great, great. Awesome. You know, I think for me, the the biggest thing that is giving us that freedom is in every single thing that we decide to do, I realize that a yes to one thing is a no to another. And we're probably going to talk a lot about this you know, idea today of essentialism and this greatest, highest contribution. And in every case, I have to say with the gifts that I've been given with the, you know, this crosshair intersection where my gifts meet my story, is this the best use of this one day that I will never get back? And that sounds like very heavy and very weighty. And it's not a perfect formula. There's certainly days when I get really off track and just do a bunch of stuff that ultimately doesn't have a lot of impact. But I think if we at least begin there, we'll land with a lot more days where we are doing that work that only we can do. And that's what the, is the just sort of like major struggle of business owners is that it's so easy to go, I can do this, so I will do this. But one of the things that we teach through all of our courses is just because you can doesn't mean you should. And so for me, I continually ask myself, what is the work that only I can do and how do I make that the priority today? And in order to make those decisions, uh, there's something that we talk about quite a bit here on the show, which is, I call it a big picture view, overarching set mm -hmm. of goals, a combination of goals and, and values, personal values that, that ultimately act as filters for the decisions that we make regarding certainly our life, but as well our business. Yeah. Is, is that kind of what enables you to decide what to say yes to and no to? Because I understand the notion of, can, am, am I the only one that can do this? But I, that I think gets a little bit muddy for some and, mm. and, and maybe in part, again, because they don't have that overarching big picture view established through which they can run all of these possibilities. We talked actually before we got started about the idea of the paradox of choice. When we have all these different options, at times it can be hard to choose. But yeah. if we're clear about our value set and then we're clear about what it is that we're trying to achieve, it makes that decision making process a little bit easier. Is that kind of how you approach it? You know, I think um, as you were talking, the thing that came to mind for me, I believe it's a Brene Brown quote. I want to make sure I give the right um, credit there. And she talks about there is just something that happens with age. And this this really is a huge part of slow growth as well. It's being willing to let time and age unravel you a little bit. And she says, at a certain age, it feels like the universe is grabbing you by the shoulders, shaking you a little bit and going, what are you waiting for? You know, there is not this infinite amount of time left. And so I think for most of us, even if we're not like a hundred percent sure what our purpose is or a hundred percent sure what our greatest, highest contribution is, there is a gnawing feeling in us of the work we've been putting off. It's that thing you can't go a day without thinking about. And you just start to recognize that the clock is ticking. And so for me, I could very easily spend all of my time in galleries, I, you know, editing. I could spend all of my time um, being a perfectionist, pushing sliders around. I could spend all of my time being on social media and pumping out content after content after content, and it disappears the next day. You know, so it's quick. gone forever. Yeah. And so for me, I think it's an urgency of there's work that I just know somewhere in the backbone running through my body like an, a lightning rod. There's work I was put here to do. And if I mess around, it's not guaranteed I'll ever get around to it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's it. It's just this urgency to say, um, wow, we know how quickly we've already addressed this, how quickly 17 years can go by and the next 17 will be faster probably because that's what we know. The longer you're alive, the faster it feels like time yeah. is going. Yeah. And so I just I just don't want to look back and have any kind of regret that I never, you know, I TikToked and Instagram my way out of my purpose. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. 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 I like that. Caitlin um, is chiming in from YouTube as well. Caitlin Workman, she says, hi, Nathan and Mary. Hey, Caitlin, thanks for, for listening in. Love to see you here. And by the way, Mary, you mentioned essentialism. So I just popped that up on Amazon for anybody who's not read that book, Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less by Greg McCune. 
uh, we'll, we'll uh, link to that in the show notes as well at bocapodcast.com. So let's get into the conversation at hand. You've referenced already the importance of slow growth versus um, kind of this modern culture style uh, of business where we just assume that things are going to happen overnight, that, that sense of overnight success or the desire, I guess, the dreaming of. What has brought you to this place where you've just realized, you're, you're acknowledging it already, but you realize the significance of the willingness to go slow, despite the fact that the world seems to make it look like we can get there really, really quickly. Yeah. You know, Nathan, I think the very first thing that I want to make sure I say to people is that slow growth became a really powerful message for me because I have lived the other one. I've, I, it's a very human instinct, especially when you're first getting started to want to just already be there, wherever there is this crosshair intersection of paid your dues and waited your turn to be there already, to be where somebody else is, to be where that person you look up to is. And when we sat down with you in 2006 in that hotel lobby, we had gone to exactly one conference, applied to speak at that conference, did mm. not get picked and couldn't understand why. <laughs> you know, we were like ready to be there already. And we did end up speaking that September to like tw- got, you know, got picked and then had 12 people in the room. And the following September, we went back to LA to speak at that conference. And that was a standing room only room. And the difference between those two, what happened in between is we spent 12 months driving in our little cherry red neon to all these different pug groups around the country, the Chattanooga pugs, being yeah. one of them, yeah, speaking to rooms of five, 10, then it grew to 20. And then it, like by the end, it was up to like 50. And we did this grassroots honing of our craft, honing of our message, asking ourselves, what is the stuff that we're doing that is truly an original idea to us? And that we're not just recycling from somebody else who did it in their business. And we said, oh, that sounds good. I'll add it to my talk then. Because that's very tempting to do too when you're first it getting is. started as a speaker. And so that's what I think it is. That's the first thing I want people to know is this instinct to matter is very human and it's not wrong. There is a deep desire to be seen, is to be known, to be known, is to be loved. And so if you are feeling that, first of all, just you know, cut yourself some slack. It just means that you care about what you're doing. But, um, when I was getting very frustrated, the the whole, that saying, which people are like, put it on a t-shirt, put it on a sweatshirt, like sell all the merch, slow growth equals strong roots. That is not even my line. It's something Justin said to me. So credit Justin Morantz. Shout um, out in Justin. Our first, <laughs> shout out Justin. In our first year of business, we were, I remember sit, this was so visceral. We were sitting in a mark, it's called Margaritas. And it was like a taco place. We were sitting outside on the patio. I had on my sunglasses, not because it was particularly bright, but because I was crying my eyes out. And I was so frustrated that these people who had started around the same time as us were just blowing up. And it felt like we were walking, like wading waist deep through molasses. Mm. And Justin said to me, he said, maybe the race they're running is not the race you're meant to run. And what I heard was, you're not cut out for this. You're not fast enough. Uh, And he said, no, no. What I mean is they're running sprints and we were created for marathons. We're going the long distance and they're just mm. running in circles. And that's when he said this, you know, powerful line 16, 17 years ago, that's now a book slow growth equals strong roots. And the reason I care so much about this message is both I've lived it and I've also been in the industry long enough to now, you know, you add in the variable of time, you zoom out a little to know that we had this long, slow, steady climb and we're still here. And other people who just sort of blew up overnight and there wasn't that like foundation to build on, they almost as quickly faded away. Mm. And so I would rather it take longer and last than to have it overnight and lose it the same way. And this is a bit of a rhetorical question, but do you think social media is kind of where our culture has started to make those assumptions that we can just get it overnight? Do you think that's what's driven a lot of it? A hundred percent, a hundred percent social media. And um, I call this this fleeting currency of success. How much, Mm. how many, how fast? Mm. If I am ever following somebody and I start to notice that all of their messages are how much, how many, how fast, that's not a person for me. That is not the leadership, the the voice of influence I want in my life. Because if the most interesting thing you have to say is how much, how many, how fast, you just might not be that interesting, right? And so it's kind of this idea of you can talk about the data, you can have an eye for growth, but if there is not this bigger reason you're showing up, this transformation you hope to help other people achieve, this 
I believe in what we're teaching this. The world needs this message. If all you care about is look how fast I grew my followers or my seven figures in 10 minutes, then that's the kind of leadership that I go. Nope. Nope. I don't want any kind of influence, you know, to be absorbed into my life from that. And talking about social media, I, I've actually got this big theory. It's a very big theory. Okay. And it's the same thing I think that gave rise to things like Fire Festival and Elizabeth Holmes, where people realized you can be anything you want to be on the internet. And they just started saying things and then they lost touch with the reality. They thought if you said it on the internet, it would become true in your real life. And that, those are very extreme examples, Fire Festival and Elizabeth Holmes. But what you see now is this constant influx of everybody you're following. The only thing they want to talk about is we doubled our packages in six months mm. or whatever the case may be. We grew our following this fast. You know, I started two months ago and I'm in <laughs> Forbes or whatever. Yeah. And, and you, I just, I really and truly believe the direction we're headed. You have to take everything you see mm. on social media with a grain of salt. You do, yeah. And it is so easy at the end of the day to say something. It's another thing to actually go do something about that. Yes. Um, and the numbers are a funny thing too because it's one thing for somebody to say they've got X number of followers. It's another thing to see the, the amount of engagement that they actually get. You know, they have 3 million yes. followers and they get like 2,000 likes or something like that. It's yeah. all rel relative in the end. The, the question, and, and I guess it really goes to a conversation about depth, really. Um, en engagement's yeah. one thing that's just kind of a, a word that we throw around as it relates to, to social media uh, or various marketing platforms. But how, how deep um, do we all go? I think just as a general question, how deep are we all actually going in, in the business that we're building, the brand that we're building? Uh, and are we willing to go the long haul to have the biggest, the most, or I guess an impact that, that carries depth? Um, yeah. An and I don't think one. we can confuse engagement with impact. That's what you're, that's what you're mm. saying. And I think we need to just like really like all pause up. to absorb that right there because we all know, and I'll see this on some of my posts, the easiest ones that are, you know, to share are sort of like the little like tweet graphics. It's all on one page. It's like a little punchy, like deep work, you know, distracted work will never be your legacy. Deep work will. And that gets like a bunch of shares. And I actually think that's a really good one that people do need to be <laughs> reminded of, yeah. but we cannot confuse you know, the accounts that get 16,000 likes and shares. Did anybody who shared that actually have a heart change? Mm. Do they, did they print that out and hang it up? Does it, is it the thing they cling to on their hard days? And so when I was talking earlier about my greatest, highest contribution, sometimes that's speaking from a stage. And sometimes that's me saying, I can't be in the room to listen to that talk. Cause I need to talk to this one person over here who just really needs to tell me their story. And they really need somebody to speak some life into them. So sometimes it is the one at a time. You know, uh, I feel like these these followings that we see, these brands that are beloved, they happened one person at a time. And, and the brands that never lost sight of the fact that these followers are real life humans one at a time behind the screen. Yeah, the opportunity to be able to impact an individual's life. It's Despite our listenership, what, what I... Um, and you know, whatever the numbers that I can throw out there, what, what I find so much, I guess, joy in, for lack of a better word is that the individual message from somebody that, that is talking about how content that we're creating has actually impacted their, has changed their life. Those are big words yeah. to say, you know, um, but yeah. to know that we have the opportunity to impact an individual, I think if we're not of that mindset, it may be time to kind of take a step back and, and reevaluate our values or even maybe establish yeah. our values to begin with. But then think about what is actually at a super deep level, what is actually motivating what we're doing, um, because it will enable this mentality of, of kind of slow growth and going, going for the long haul. Let me go ahead and jump, though, to you actually shared um, a few principles, five actually principles with me in advance of our conversation today that will enable creatives, entrepreneurs, photographers, specifically in this case, to be able to, to think about and ultimately run their business based on this idea of slow growth. And, and the mm -hmm. first one, and I'll just, I'll quote you directly is, is the idea of embracing the character, embrace the character, wisdom, and good stewardship of business that can only be built over time. Um, it, I'll, again, ask a little bit of a rhetorical question here. Is it really that good businesses can only be built over time? Like what about those quick roads to success that we see around us? Should we just ignore those for the sake of this, this idea that you're talking about? 
Yeah, I, it reminds me of a post I put up recently that said something to the effect of, do you want to know the quickest way to see good fruit rot on the vine or turn into scorched earth? It's to trust it to somebody who only showed up for the harvest. And so what I mean by that is like when somebody is sort of only um, concerned with what's in it for them, you know, can I hit a certain income? Can I speak on a certain stage, et cetera, et cetera. They have not had to put in the care and the tending. They, there, there's something that happens on a heart level when you put in the time. And I think it's something like grit is a muscle that's built over time. And I see, I, I, I've been actually really shocked. Maybe you can speak to this as well. I have been shocked, shocked to hear the number of photographers who are hitting the three-year mark and burning out. Mm. Now, it used to be that was like a seven year, you know, kind of thing, or maybe a mm -hmm. 10 year mm -hmm. thing. And I'm like, oh yeah, that sounds about right on time. Three years. And so what I'm, what I'm taking from that is that the barriers of entry, these low barriers of entry are actually, they create a low tolerance for adversity, right? We're not building up that resilience. We're not building up that tenacity. We haven't fallen down seven times to pick ourselves up eight. And so the first time we get the wind knocked out of us, it's really tempting to just kind of jump ship and run. And so for me, when I think about, I write about this in both dirt and slow growth, it's this idea of you know, I grew up as what I would call a hard story person. And I had a friend growing up who was a very easy story person. She had the like sitcom house and the sitcom family and, <laughs> you know, got the good yeah. genes when it was time to go to school, whatever the case is, got the car when she turned 16, whatever. And for a lot of my life, if somebody would have given me the opportunity to Jamie Lee Curtis Freaky Friday with her in a snap, you know, if the genie in the bottle would give me a wish, I would have taken that any day, all day, every day. And I think it's the moment when you have gone long enough in your life that the kindness, the gentleness, the empathy, the good stewardship, the, you know, just resilience that you would never trade those things you have become just to have an easier story. I think this is the beginning of wisdom. And so I talk about like my very scientific theories were all born into the world with these hard edges and pain, like progressively finer grits of sandpaper rounds off the edges and makes us a soft place to land for other people. And so for me, that's what happens when you run a business over time, when you have seen these things before, you know, we're in 2023, inflation is crazy. We've just walked through the last few years guess what? We also were building our business in 2008 at the height of the housing market crisis. We so we have seen yeah. this before, mm -hmm. you know, different versions of it. We mm -hmm. know how to sort of keep calm and carry on. And so I think there's just something that happens to you. This, you know, we're in New England, we're in Connecticut where you sort of the same sort of saltiness that kind of weathers New Englanders for hard winters is the same thing that happens to business owners. And, and that's sort of how we become this kind of salt of the earth right? We, 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 it, salt preserves. Mm. Salt is what cures us. Mm. And so going through the hard storms, that is the salt that cures us. Well, it, it seems as though we've gotten kind of soft and, and that's a very general statement I realize. But when, when we look at the commentary online, it does seem, and, and you talk about, you know, people kind of bailing on a business so quickly. Yeah. It, it seems like we've got, because we're lucky enough, probably anybody listening in at this point, or at least most, live in a first world culture where we have yeah. nonstop opportunities and options all around us, despite whatever challenges we may have come from, uh, it's, it's very easy then in that context to get a bit soft. And then the idea of having to put work in that might cause discomfort or fear or apprehension or even pain, as you were talking about, yeah. that that's not as commonplace anymore. I'm curious though, to ask you about this, because I, I tend to go the other extreme. I ask for pain. Like I, I'm going to the gym, whether it's in gym, you know, going to the gym or running my business, taking on big opportunities, doing kind of crazy things. I, I tend to go that direction in part because I'm, I'm willing to, to take on the potential pain and the discomfort that comes from pushing myself outside my comfort yeah. zone. But I also realize we can kind of take that to an extreme where maybe we're not highly aware of um, not the easy road, but I guess the road that it is be a better fit for us. Like, where is the balance between pushing? Man, I'm trying to think of the best way to word this. I guess just pushing for the sake of growth, like having that value, mm. 
but then also yeah. getting to a place where we're we're literally kicking like slamming our head against the wall unnecessarily because there's actually a better opportunity that better fits our strengths and values that we could actually follow at where's that i line? love this question i love this okay. question so much and i 100 percent know what you're talking about I, listen i grew up in appalachia <laughs> i grew up in the 1980s yeah i'm like technically an ex annual i guess i'm like the last year of the gen x first year of the millennial depending on how you define it uh, you know, uh, only child, all, all, all of these factors, Enneagram four with a strong achiever wing. Like I do not like showing weakness. I do not like doing anything. You know, I grew up with the message, both explicit and implicit that if you didn't work your tail off for it, if you didn't struggle for it, you did not deserve it. Mm. And so I have perpetually had to kind of check my attitude of, am I intentionally or like subconsciously not even aware I'm doing it? making it harder because if it wasn't hard, I don't feel like I can deserve it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's something yeah. about that. I think part of what it, part of it, it on my part, uh, or the reason that that drives me in this way is because I'm so annoyed listening to and watching people complain about the most ridiculous things. And I'm like, it, mm. and, and, and part of, part of that, what drives that is the narrative that I am, I mean, you brought up Enneagrams. I tend to push back when it comes to personality types, Enneagrams, this idea, because not because there's not any value to them, but because the tendency in our culture is to use that as a scapegoat. I am in this yeah. box and this is where I am going to stay and will continue to live. And the conversation mm -hmm. ends there versus an openness and willingness to push beyond that discomfort to potentially improve as an individual or business owner or both. And so I, I, I that frustrates me so badly. That in part is what kind of fuels my tendency to kind of push to an extreme uh, in many cases. Mm -hmm. But I also realize, and, and I've been thinking about this more lately actually, that I may actually be unnecessarily making things complicated at times just under the guise of, well, exactly what you're describing, of, yeah. of being willing to, not only willing to, but almost doing it to prove a point, take the more difficult road. And so, yeah, I was just kind of curious of your take on like, where where is that line? How do we mm -hmm. make the distinction between um, what is growth and then what is just like self-torture? <laughs> yeah. You know, I had um, John Acuff, uh, author of the book Soundtracks on and many other amazing books on my podcast. And he was talking about one of his soundtracks, especially when he sits down to write, is let it be easy. Because he was getting really frustrated with this narrative that like the blinking cursor and the blank page had to like completely destroy you. And he was like letting that get into his head. And so he started every time he sat down to write, he started saying, let it be easy, let it be light. And that's really challenging for me because it really made me realize that I want people to be impressed with what I had to, I have a huge underdog complex, obviously, uh, you know, trailer to Yale law, like make the movie already. Let's go. All right. Yeah. It's, it's been made. That's fine. Um, and so, uh, you know, there is just this like tendency to want it to be hard. So people don't question whether I deserve it. But the thing I want people to hear right now is that one of the things I have experienced in my life, because the, the tension of slow growth is that our life has been this very slow, long, slow burn climb mixed in with moments of windfall that I could have never seen coming. And so there is something that happens when you are operating in alignment with what you were created to do. I'm not saying it suddenly always becomes easier. You won't have to fight for it. But when you are finally kind of letting go of all the different things you have to be or things you have to chase in order to matter. And you just say, this is the work I was created to do and I'm going to go do it for a while. It's incredible how the universe sort of rises up to meet you. It's mm. incredible how the doors do start to open, how like the chess pieces kind of start to move on your behalf. And the hands down best things that have ever happened in my life, I'm counting Yale, Justin, our home, my book deal, they came in that sort of like, I never could have done them just by the work of my own hands. I, I had to put in mm, the work, interesting. but there was something else that met me. Yeah. 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 You know, that's interesting, actually. When I think about it for myself anyway, that there's this kind of gross ego almost that's involved in this idea that I have to work hard because I'm going to make it happen. And there's yeah. a lot of it that's true. This is a both end conversation, obviously, like so many are. But but at the same time, it's pretty egotistical on my part that I think that I have to behave in that particular way all the time or nothing's going to get done. Uh, there's a certain amount of almost quiet openness and awareness mm -hmm. that needs to happen simultaneously to the opportunities at hand. So, wow, I, that's a deep conversation. I think we could spend like two or three episodes <laughs> just on that. I want to keep going, though, to, to the next idea. And this is an interesting one. Um, and it is the notion of focusing on doing less better than doing more just for the sake of doing more. 
And the reason I say this is interesting, especially for the photography industry, and, and I'll include myself in this because I'm, I'm a perfectionist as well, is that doing less better, like I, I already know how much I obsess over the stuff that I do and trying to make it you know, as good as possible. How do we do less better, but then not play into the tendencies that a lot of us creatives have to be mm. too much a perfectionist? And that ultimately, of course, gets in the way of us actually getting something done. Yeah. Well, so just to, for everybody who's listening, I, I really want to like, well, first of all, we'll just really get the punctuation. It's do less dot, dot, dot better. It's not just do less better, just do worse in everything. <laughs> um, and that, the second thing I want to make sure that I hit is that is not my quote. That is Jen Olmstead, mm. who is brilliant. She's a brilliant marketing person. She said this recently on Instagram. And then I had her on my podcast to talk about sort of five mini marketing masterclasses. And this was number one. And, and it's a really, when she posted that, it was a really good gut, gut punch for me. And I know for a lot of people, especially people I coach, I call them out on this all the time. When I start coaching somebody, especially somebody who's been a photographer and they're ready to step into speaking or education, it very quickly becomes, this is what it looks like to be successful. I must have a mastermind, a membership site, my courses, I want to speak at this conference. Like they all have to happen this year. Like this quarter would be great. And this, you know, it sort of gets into like the Pareto principle where 80% of our outputs and results will come from 20% of our inputs. So just to kind of like put it in perspective, let's get some practical working examples. Um, one of the biggest things they will tell you when you start getting into digital marketing or courses is you don't need another offer. You don't need another course. You don't need another product. What you need is a better evergreen strategy to drive people to the course you already have and a heart and a desire to make that course the best, the signature course on that topic that's ever existed. Mm. And so we have a ton of courses, but we know the number one, our, our 80% of results people mm. come to us for is our j &M lighting course. Mm. And so we said, what would it look like for us to go all in on making that the hands down best lighting course it could be and to make sure we're just driving people to that over and over. We're, when we feel that itch as an entrepreneur to come up with a shiny new thing, let's make it a shiny new way to get people to that evergreen thing that already exists. Photographers listening, you could push sliders around editing, 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 or you could say, actually, I could let that go and go focus on making my art the best it could be. I could go study my craft. I could become the best at the thing only I can do. And so it's just sort of this permission to say, you do not have to do all the things. Pick the ones that feel best and do them the best that you can. Well, and, and what came to mind is you're describing how you and Justin looked at that particular course. It, it, what, what the word that came to mind was value. Like how much more value can I add to this thing that I'm doing yes. that, that in, in your case has already seen some success rather than trying to do all of the things. It's not about making this, this one thing that's doing so well perfect. It's about how can I add even more value, potentially more value to that to make the biggest impact at the end of the day. And that yeah. doesn't have anything to do with perfectionism. It's, it's just right. about the right approach at that point. And so I think that's yeah. a really good distinction for our listeners to make, for myself to make for that matter too, between doing less dot, 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 as you said, better. <laughs> the way I actually put it on my, my notes was a dash. So doing less yeah. better, <laughs> yeah. but um, it, in, in that process, it's it, again, it would potentially be easy to become a bit perfectionistic if you're doing less, but mm. rather than taking that approach to focus on just simply, how can I add as much value as possible to this thing, the service, this product that I'm offering uh, yeah. for me anyway, that that's a good distinction. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that there has been a real, like a, we've really lost this difference or this, you know, an ability to distinguish between perfect and excellence. And mm. I would actually argue that in this desire, because you see this message a lot, like perfectionism is the most advanced form of procrastination, which I actually really love that quote. Um, and what we know is that the deeper vein running underneath that is we think that perfect can keep us safe. That if we can just make this thing we're launching into the world before we do that, if we can just make it its most perfect version, nobody can criticize it. And in a desire to swing away from perfectionism, like just do it. You were taking like this Nike approach, just do it. It'll be great. You know, <laughs> launch and figure it out later. Yeah. I think we have thrown the baby out with the bathwater of excellence. Mm. And so one of the things I get really frustrated with, especially as a photographer or when we were teaching photographers was when anybody else was teaching your clients will never know. And I'm like, but you'll know. 
That's integrity. That's excellence. So like, I think there's a difference of saying, I'm going to hit send. I'm going to hit publish on this thing. And I know it's not perfect because I know perfect doesn't actually exist, but I'm proud of it. I would put my name on it. Somebody could find it today. Somebody could find it 10 years from now. And I will be the same amount of proud of it. I will still, you know, maybe I've grown, maybe I've evolved. Maybe my work's gotten better, but the version I was on that day who put that out into the world genuinely believed it could help people. And so that's, that's, I think the difference for me, like books are really hard. They're one way conversations. Mm. You don't ever get to clarify. And so you can really be frozen by that. And my standard has become, it's, you know, it will never be perfect, but am I, am I proud of it? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Proud of it. And, and I bet too, you, you've begun to get a feel for what does bring the most value at the end of the day, I mean, and, and, and that's such a, it's such a loaded topic. It's a deep topic and it's, it, I realize subjective at the end. Um, but you understand ultimately based on conversations that you've had with individuals, presentations that you've done, workshops, you taught, et cetera, um, what has gotten the most engagement to use our earlier word, the, the actual, that has actually driven impact and you've gotten response as a result of it. I, yeah. I'm thinking about this, uh, maybe it's a little bit of an odd comparison, but for anybody who uh, might be watching the live stream, I'll, I'll go full screen. There we go. There we go. <laughs> um, in the background here, so I'm, I just live in a simple apartment. And in my apartment here in the background, I'm pointing to a refrigerator on, uh, behind me. And on that refrigerator are snapshots taken with, I think all the images actually just snapped with phones over the years. Uh, various versions of the iPhone probably in most cases. They're, they are not framed per perfectly. They're not color corrected. None of them are probably blurry. And despite having been a wedding photographer for you know over a decade and own an editing company for 15 plus years, that stuff just doesn't matter to me. What actually matters to me is, I mean, it sounds cliche, but it's reality, the moments, the, the mm. relationships represented by those, those images. That's where the biggest impact lies. And so what I think about photographers, I mean, editing is an easy example to pull from because that, it's very close to my heart. But when I think about photographers, and I think you kind of alluded to it as well, Mary, you know, a, making nuanced adjustments to sliders under the guise of it has to be just so, yeah. they're, they're forgetting about what is actually most impactful in that case. Mm. So the perfectionism starts to play in to this thing that we've made important for ourselves. And in some honest conversations, it may, you know, we may even be able to explore how that's, that's kind of a distraction from the thing that we actually need to be spending time on. It's, it's easy to get caught up in these little details, but do yeah. they, are those details, the thing that are actually making the biggest impact? And if we have an honest conversations with ourselves, um, I think it's relatively speaking is easy to establish what is most impactful within the service, the product that we're selling. And that's where we can put our, our biggest effort and energy. Yeah. You know what actually I was thinking about when you were talking too, is that the irony of this, and clearly we're both, we're going to be biased on this advice we're going to give, but the irony of this is that people are pushing around sliders, both being perfectionists, but also because the lighting in the situation was mixed and they're trying to fix, fix it afterwards. Sure. Ironically, if they gave up that editing, they would have time to go learn the lighting and the flash that would then fix, you know, a lot of those problems. And listen, yeah. that's a very specific example for this group. But the truth is all of us do that as people and as entrepreneurs, yes. really personal, random example. It's not really personal. It is a personal example. That's really random. Sure. Um, we have a flag flying outside of our house and the pole that it was on the hook broke. And so I was going out every single day it would fall down and I was pulling it back up and fixing it, pulling it back up and fixing it. And I was finally like, you know what? Why and I just like take the five minutes to swap it over to the other <laughs> pole. And I did that and now I don't have to fix it. Right. But like in that moment when you're flying by the seat of your pants and you're doing all the things and it's busy for the sake of busy and it's all about the volume, mm -hmm. it's really hard to go. What if I just stopped, breathed, took a breath yeah, and with slow intention, fix this thing at a deeper level or on a broader right. level. Yeah. And it has, it has, much or much more impactful results uh, over the long run. Yeah, you're right. Okay, yeah. I want to. I, I know it'd be easy to continue to to dig into that, but I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> keep going here. And I actually, I mentioned that that you shared five principles with me. I kind of combined two into to one question here for you. You talk about the tendency toward comparison, um, mm. and then there's that kind of simultaneous effort to try to get a, approval from others, right? Because the, the comparison tendency is at least in part rooted in security. If we can get some approval from others, then we address some of those insecurities. 
So I, I guess the question for you is when we're talking about this tendency toward comparison, mm. um, you say that we can, if we actually focus on what we're able to achieve over time uh, mm -hmm. and put our efforts into that, that slow growth mentality uh, and take that approach to business, that naturally we can trump the high volume, low quality approach to business. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of an interesting way to think about it. I hadn't thought about it that quite that way before, but can you explain that, break that down a little bit for our listeners so they have a bit more context? As, and because at the end of the day, I think most of us struggle with that tendency toward comparison, um, yeah. the innate securities therein, and then trying to get approval from others. How do we break apart from that and understand the significance of this principle of, of and benefit over the long run of, of that slow growth approach? Yeah, so it's a it's a big question and a big answer. So it's going to be a little bit long, but bear with me because it's going to be good. It's going to get there. Um, the first thing that I want all of us to take into account is this idea of kindergarten basketball. If you've ever watched kindergartners play basketball or you've seen it on a TV show. <laughs> That's just me um, playing basketball now. <laughs> it's about the level that I play same, at. <laughs> same. But what we know when kindergartners are playing basketball is that there is no zones, right? Wherever the ball goes, everybody chases it. Yeah, and they run yeah. down to this end of the court and they chase it and then they run down to this end mm -hmm. of the court. And that is what grown up entrepreneurs do with every shiny new thing that comes out. Everybody wants to be the first to give their hot take on the new technology or the new social platform or, or you know why this is going to change everything or whatever and so it can feel like this perpetual game of just running back and forth chasing things chasing things and I call this the checklist of other people's success which is you know you're looking around in your industry and you're going okay cool so that person is doing a got it do a Oh, but that person's doing B. They just launched a mastermind. Okay, mastermind. That person's doing C. They just did a wedding in Italy. Okay, do a wedding in Italy. And then your brain does this really tricky sleight of hand where it doesn't go, in order to be successful, do A, B, or C. It goes, in order to be successful, you must do all of them, A, B, and C. And mm. then it continues to add to that list until it's like double Zs or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's a constantly moving target. And so we're perpetually comparing. We're perpetually adding. My friend Graham Cochran just released a podcast episode with a um, person who was talking about mimetic tendencies, M-E-M. So like to, to mimic mimetic tendencies where we see somebody else doing something. We didn't even want to do that thing, but now we've seen them doing it and now we must do it too. We must mimic them. We must do what they're doing in order to be successful. And so we can start to get, I, I can very vividly remember being at those early conferences, those early pug groups. And as soon as you walked into the room, you felt your heart go, <gasps> right? Like you, your heart was racing. You couldn't catch your breath. It was just frenetic energy, mm. this frantic, frenzied, frenetic energy. Um, Justin and I, right after the first partner con in LA, took a car and drove out to the Grand Canyon. We stopped off at Lake Mead. Uh, to stretch our legs and at Lake Mead they have hatcheries so the sidewalk gives way to these this floating dock with these like screaming gulping mouths suddenly uh, on either side of your feet they're they're just like silently screaming at you fighting each other flop you know knocking each other down flopping all over one another just to fight it out over crumbs mm. meanwhile these wild things in captivity if they just turned around there's a wild expanse of freedom in the other direction and so that is sort of the like that's the like picture I'm to paint for us is we're adding to this checklist. We have this frenetic heart. We're chasing the basketball. Freedom is in the other direction. And for me, we begin to find this other direction. We begin to find peace. You know, it's like dirty dancing, thump, 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 thump. You know, we can feel our heart rate slow down when we start to go, okay, there are weeds, there are flowers, there are trees as business owners. It's very tempting if you've ever walked into your yard and there are a million dandelions or six foot milkweed pops up overnight, this dizzying height, this dizzying multiplication. It's so tempting to go, I want to grow just like a weed. And then you realize anybody who's ever walked through a garden, we just did this the other day. Bloop, you pull that weed out. There's a half inch of roots or they just come out with such ease. They knock right over at the first storm. You start to realize there is a reason why redwood giants are on a very different timetable than weeds, than milkweed. And that if we want, you know, when we first see, there's a tree that actually just got planted in the park across the street. It's a sapling tree. It's about six feet tall, brand new baby tree. It's honestly not that impressive. It's new. It's growing. It's really easy to just look over it. But right next to it is a tree that has stood there for, I don't know how many years, these gnarled, twisted roots, this twisting trunk, these arms reaching to the sky. Justin and I legitimately are in love with this tree. We like beam love out to it every day. Every storm we get, please don't fall over. Please don't die. We love you. 
that tree earned that respect. It earned that love. Mm. It earned that twisting. It earned those gnarled roots weathering the storms over time. There's a reason if we want to walk among the giants, we have to be willing to put in the time. And so when we know there's a reason we've been set apart, there's a reason we're being called to a longer journey. It's because we're not running sprints. We're running a marathon. We're not going fast. We're going far. It's a lot easier to let that comparison fall away. Well, it just the the amount of anxiety, and, and that can be released as a result of not obsessing over what happens in the next twenty four hours. Yeah, it's pretty incredible to think about. And and I, I mean, I'm thinking about it honestly because I'm thinking about my circumstances and the various things that I've been frustrated with or dealing with as of late. But the moment yeah. you let go of that notion that this thing's got to happen in this much time, or I'm going to earn this much money, or I'm going to build a business this big. It, it's not about not working anymore. It's just letting go of the idea that it has to happen overnight. And now yes. you can kind of restructure your approach to day-to-day -day life. Yes. Once you're and willing you know to let, let that obsession go. And Nathan, here's the other thing that I know about us and I know about entrepreneurs. If something happened, if we could get a Freaky Friday situation or a genie granted us a wish and everything we ever wanted was handed to us overnight, we woke up tomorrow morning and we didn't have to do anything to make it happen, it wouldn't matter as much to us. We wouldn't yeah. want it. Yeah. We wouldn't want it if we didn't at least like do something with our own hands to build it. Yeah. Right. I just feel like that's something that gets lost. And I never want the most interesting thing about me to be how little time I've been at this work. I want to mm. be an author for the rest of my life. I hope mm. I'm 95 years old and saying, wait, one more thing, write this down. Right. And so I can, I can just not get in such a hurry. Mm. You know, I, something I realized about me, this goes back to the hard story, you know, easy story. This is a false dichotomy. It's not like you actually have to choose. But if I was given the choice of you can either be a New York Times bestseller overnight, but the book will be fluff because you were more focused on the marketing than the excellence, than the content, or you can know that you're going to have to write 10 books before that ever happens for you. But the moment it does, this tipping point moment and all eyes are on that book in the previous nine or 10 that you can know you can be proud of and stand by every one of them, I would take the second option every time. And mm. listen, there, there are a million permutations in between. Of course. I'm not saying you can't be a smart marketer and be uh, have excellence, but that the second I realized that, that I actually wouldn't want it fast if it meant it had to lose any of that excellence, the pressure was off. The, I heard a quote recently from a guy named Alex Hormozzi. I think they're kind of mixed opinions about this guy, but he's been super successful in business. And one of the things he said that really caught my attention, he said, I would rather be rich for sure than rich quick. I'm like, huh? Yeah. yeah, that's an interesting way to think about it. Not that, of course, this conversation is simply about being rich, but mm -hmm. what, however we define success, yeah. I would rather be successful for sure than successful overnight or successful quickly. And that was yeah. a, that was a really good uh, kind of a wake up call and, and layer that on top of this conversation. And this has really got my wheels turning. So I, I appreciate this. I want to ask, I have kind of one last question for you regarding yet another principle that you mentioned. Uh, mm. There's a bit of a, we've talked about it a little bit here on the podcast, but there's a bit of an odd obsession. I, I say odd obsession. That's, that's my quote, by the way, with the concept of imposter syndrome, the idea of imposter syndrome in our culture right now. And mm. I'm curious why you think that might be. And mm. as creative entrepreneurs, how we can kind of move beyond that thought process. Yeah, I'm really interested in this. Will you tell me a little bit more about the odd obsession part? Because uh, <laughs> I, 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 I talk to, I coach a lot of people and I'm like, yeah, imposter syndrome is, is out there. So tell me about the odd obsession part. Well, I guess I'm curious why so many people feel... Well, I think in, in part, it, it, it has to start with a definition, right? And I had a, a conversation with another, another individual um, on this podcast as well about, about this topic. Mm. And the, one of the things they pointed out, which made it even more interesting to me, was the idea of being an imposter is that you're faking something, as in yeah. you're not being honest about something. And that, that makes it even more confusing to me. Why do so many people feel as though they are imposters, as in they are putting on, they're faking, they're putting on a, a front when really what we're talking about in most cases is just taking small steps despite our shortcomings, right? Yeah. When you build, when you go build a business for the first time, you have no idea what the heck you're doing, yeah, but that doesn't right. make you an imposter. It's just, you don't know mm. what you're doing and you're learning along the way. We just have mm. a tendency in our culture to throw out words and phrases without actually considering 
as nerdy as it might sound, dictionary level definitions of what these words are that we're saying. The unfortunate reality of that though, is that it has in some cases kind of subconscious effects on the way that we look at the world, the way that we frame the world and our experience of it. And then that begins to translate to the way we behave. So Mm -hmm. to just simply say that we have imposter syndrome in many cases seems to ignore what those words actually mean. And maybe if we reframe the conversation more accurately, it would help minimize that the, the various insecurities that we have, the frustration, the fear, the, the anxiety. So I, yeah, I, I, I don't yeah. mean to ramble, but that's, that's a little bit of context for you as to, to my confusion about this conversation. I, and yeah. insecurity is one thing, but imposter syndrome, it just takes it to a whole nother level. And I'm just confused mm-hmm. as to why so many people feel that way. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I'm so glad I asked that because that, that really makes a lot of sense to me. Um, it reminds me of that quote. I think it's actually also a John Acuff quote. Shout out to John Acuff. Um, that's basically like be willing to be bad at something new. And it's just it's yeah. releasing this expectation that you should be there wherever there is yeah. uh, right off the bat. To me, what I have been experiencing with the people that I'm coaching is sort of the flip side of that. And um, that conference that I was just at, um, Caitlin Workman, if she's still watching, she was there as well. And, um, I was, again, just as I was shocked about the three years and ready to like, I'm burnout, I'm done. Like, wow, did that timeline get collapsed? Uh, I was also equally shocked with the number of people who were even saying they were terrified to do like relatively simple things like show up on social media, yeah. um, to like share something that they like, that they feel like other people might not like. And I was like, geez, Lou, have we reached a point of like, this is the formula for success and do not deviate from the path. And so if, if for, I can interrupt for just a second, though, yeah. even that example is, is uh, that's an example, yet another example of using words that are so extreme. Like I'm terrified to post something on social media. Are you really terrified? Yeah. Like are you about to pee your pants and you're sweating <laughs> profusely because you just, you know, like are these words that we use, these phrases that we use are so extreme in our culture. We just throw them out there. And, and I, in many of those cases, we don't actually mean what we're saying, right? But we've, mm. we've built it up in our mind and in the minds of others. We've made this, this very extreme uh, or this less than extreme scenario, very ex- uh, quite extreme yeah. unnecessarily. But again, whether that's conscious or subconscious, what that then translates to is the way that we see the world and frame the world. And we, st- we continue to do that same thing over and over again. That's going to build up and very much become our reality. So that's yes. where I, I just wonder if we might need to reframe the conversation a little bit. Well, I think that's so true. And I think the, the, the sentence or the phrase that gets underlined twice there is that it's been built up to. And mm. so when you ask, are they actually terrified? I do think they actually are. Mm. Like, I do think this fear of rejection or losing bookings or, or veering off a path, like, like the critical thinking muscle that you and I built up when there weren't a lot of resources and we did sort of have to innovate and figure it out ourselves um, the, the, the upside of Facebook groups and courses and all of that is that it can really speed up how quickly you can launch a business. The downside is that you don't, you, you forget how to trust your own voice. Hmm. You forget how to trust your own decision-making. And so I do actually think it feels very right or wrong. I do think it feels very paralyzing for them. And so, um, the other thing I want to add to this, I don't want to miss, cause I, I've really been thinking about this is I believe that in going back to everything we were saying about chasing the basketball and busy for the sake of busy in this frenetic activity on social media and high volume, I think a big reason people are feeling like imposters right now is because they've allowed themselves to get so busy doing the busy work, being seen or whatever, that they know they haven't gotten to get around to doing the work. They haven't gotten around to, there's like this missing gap skill set that they know I am walking into this wedding and I don't actually know how to do that thing. You know, obviously hmm. for us, that's, we hear that about lighting a lot, Yeah. but we know when people don't ha- aren't right with their lighting, they don't raise prices because they feel like an imposter. They don't shoot at certain venues because they don't think they'll be able to live to deliver. They don't want to work with certain planners because they don't think they're there yet. And so I feel like part of it is this, we're doing distracted work hmm. and we're not getting around to the deep work. You know, one of my favorite quotes is from Steve Martin, be so good. They can't ignore you well, we're not prioritizing or making time for the work that actually makes you so good. So we do feel like a little bit of a fraud. Hmm. Okay. So feeling like a fraud because we haven't put the work in. So it's, yeah. Okay. That I I can see that, that, that makes sense. I, I, when I think about just my own path and, and, and again, I realize all of this is subjective, but 
you know, I think about the fact that I don't have a college degree. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have any official or technical photographic training, certainly business training. And that everything that I ultimately was able to accomplish along with those around me was really just a matter of like doing the work, certainly a bunch of Google searching, learning from hard knocks, you know, from, from various experiences. Yep. But from my perspective, that doesn't mean I'm a fraud. You know, I didn't, I don't have a degree, no. but I was able to build a multi-million dollar company. Am I a fraud because I don't have a degree? No, it was just the way that I, I got to a place to, to this place in my life. Um, which was mm -hmm. just putting work in, using Google a lot, asking other people questions, reading books. But does that, does that make me a fraud or, you well, know, does it make me an imposter? That, that's where, it, and I, maybe, it, maybe I'm just being too literal with the, with the conversation with, with the, the words or phrases at hand. But I, again, I still think that that might be playing into creating more anxiety or depression or whatever the, the emotion than necessary because we're building that thing up a little bit too big rather than taking a step back and defining it in a little bit more nuanced way. But maybe mm. I'm reading into it too much. <laughs> well, the thing I would say to you is that when I, when I heard that description, I heard you did do the work. You know, like, yes, maybe a part of your story is that you don't have a college degree, but then you sort of like made your own curriculum with the books that you've read and the people you've talked to and the, you know, courses or videos that you've watched. Imagine how you would feel if you didn't do any of that intermediate, you know, the intermediate stuff. Hmm. You just said, I don't have a college degree. I don't know any of this stuff. I feel like a fraud. Then what I'm saying would be true, right? Hmm. You would feel like, oh, like I, I haven't, I don't know what my numbers are. I haven't even looked at my pricing. I, I don't even know if I'm profitable. I don't know how much that costs. It's that work of saying, maybe I don't have an MBA from somewhere fancy, hmm. but I will create my own MBA through the school of hard knocks through through the like we're becoming a society that is very much about not going to school for it but becoming an yeah. apprentice in it so what yeah. you described all i heard was doing the work doing the work doing the work doing the work i am talking about when you're you know showing up and you know you don't know how to light something or you're showing up and you mm. you don't know how to shoot that at high noon on the beach or whatever the case is um that's that's what i think like if i were to write a book and I knew that the book was no good. And then I had to show up and talk about the book. I would feel like an imposter. But I don't feel that way. You know, I heard somebody, a friend of mine say, you should talk about your stuff the way you tell other people about Hamilton. And I've never seen Hamilton. Don't. I want to. I just haven't yet. <laughs> um, but I got the reference. You should, you should know what you bring to the table and believe in what you bring to the table so much that you can walk into any room. And that, I think, is a result of doing the work. Like, I put the blood, sweat, and tears to be mm. a really excellent writer. I know I'm a good writer. I know this book changes lives. Mm. So I have no problem talking about it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what I mean by doing the work. That totally makes sense though. And I, I can't remember the person to reference in this case, but I, I just heard somebody, I just heard somebody talking about how rather than going and standing in front of the mirror and reciting, I, I don't know why the word's slipping my mind. What, what is it when we like say oh, affirmations? Rather than going yeah. and standing in front of the mirror and reciting affirmations for the sake of making ourselves feel, feel better about ourselves, what we need to do is actually go do the work. Actually, it may have been Alex Homrosi as well. We need to actually go do the work. If we do the work mm -hmm. and we do that, that, continue to do the work over and over again, exactly what happens or exactly what you said happens, which is we actually then have proof of concepts, right? We can actually back yes. up what it is that we're saying with what we're doing. The problem a lot of times, uh, and certainly I've been guilty of it, is, is that we go and say something before actually doing the thing to back it up. And, and we need to reverse that strategy. And again, yes. I think social media, not to make too big of a deal about social media, social media has encouraged that because it's very easy to get on and post a cute graphic or put a you know, video on and make everything sound really, really great. But the question is, do, have we done the work? So in order to overcome yeah. this tendency toward imposter syndrome, or for that matter, insecurities in general, what we need to do is start putting the work in, do the repetitions. And yes. as a result, then not only will we be able to overcome those, those feelings, but ultimately we'll see results if we're doing the yes. right work. Yeah. And the other thing I would add to that is that none of it is wasted and you carry it with you because the same kind of, I know I've put in the time, I know I've made myself a student of the craft. I know 
this brings transformation. The same kind of thing that I learned in the trenches of being a photographer, I carried with me into author world. Mm -hmm. And I will say that people respond to that. They can tell when you believe in the thing that you're doing and when mm. you have the confidence that comes from doing the work. And so I am getting opportunities in that world faster mm. than I did in the photography world because ironically, there was an Oscar winner. I'm not even sure the name. This was like years and years ago, but the video keeps showing up on my Instagram and it says, <laughs> if you want to go fast, be willing to go slow. Mm. You know, uh, Lewis Carroll said, the hurrier I go, the behinder I get. And so when you are willing <laughs> to kind of like, it, it is like a tipping point. It's a groundswell. It's a slow, mm. slow, 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 steady climb until mm. it is an mm. overnight success. Yeah. I love it. Well, I think it's a beautiful way to sum up our conversation too. Um, I do want to kind of highlight your site and the book just a little bit more too. And you haven't, to be clear, breaking the fourth wall, everybody listening in, Mary didn't come on here <laughs> asking to to set her up for a big commercial, but I do want to share Mary because, <laughs> you know, one of the things I, I wanted to say early on in the conversation, when, when you were talking about you and Justin speaking on stage at those early conferences, the intention, and I'm sure many of our listeners can, mm. can hear it in our conversations here, the intention, the preparation well, it, it really does start with intention and then the preparation that you put into your presentations is far, 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 far surpassed so many of the so-called industry celebrities at the time that I was hearing mm. speak from stage. And that's not to, to bash anybody. The, the point that I'm making here is that what you have to offer uh, comes from a, a genuine place. And certainly you've put yeah. the work in. Um, and I, I think our listeners can learn quite a bit from not only what you're teaching, but of course, writing about as well. So will you just kind of direct everybody's attention to where they can find and learn more about you, your brand, the book, and, and maybe even learn a bit about the, the book that you're getting ready to put out next. Yeah. So, um, I'll show the two books for everybody who's watching live and then we'll kind of like describe them, uh, for people listening. So the first book came out in 2020 it's dirt. It is the story of growing up in a trailer to Yale law school, but it's really much more a, like a an odyssey, I guess, of making peace with your past. And as soon as I turned that book in, I realized that it was only like half of the bookend of the full story, because if you make peace with your past, but you're still holding your present prisoner to your past, in mm. other words, you're still trying to overcome it or overcompensate for it or what have you, then you're still not truly free. And so slow growth equals strong roots. The subtitle is finding grace, freedom, and purpose in an overachieving world. And it is this idea of how do we stop trying to gold star our way into worth. And what's really cool for everybody listening is that in slow growth, um, it's for, especially for the photographers listening, it is actually full of really beautiful photography that Justin and I took at a time in our business when we were the most burnout because we were creating for everybody but ourselves. And so there are yeah. these editorial photos of ballerinas and the shoot we did in Venice. And as I'm writing the book, trying to like verbally, viscerally process what it is to always try to be achieving for your worth, like if achieving were oxygen, this primal visceral survival, we don't know how to go a day without it. Um, I realized these characters, this tightrope walker, this performer always on her toes, this illusionist in the distance who can't start until she's perfect, a masquerader hiding in plain sight, and a contortionist twisting herself up into tiny tethered knots because to contort is easier than to be criticized. Those photos lined up perfectly with these characters. And so we actually turned that into a quiz. It takes about two minutes. It's called the Achiever Quiz. You can find it at achieverquiz.com. Achiever, A-C-H-I-E-V-E-R, quiz.com or marymarians.com slash quiz. And it will tell you not only which of the five types you are, but it will tell you your strengths, where you get stuck and how you start. Yeah, there it is. Cool. There yeah, it is for it up everybody here. watching. And we will link to, of course, all of this in the show notes at bocopodcast.com, but achieverquiz.com. What's your achiever type? The performer, the tightrope mm -hmm. walker, the contortionist, the masquerader, the illusionist in the distance. That's right. Okay, That's cool. Right. Yeah, we're going to we're gonna link to that for everybody yeah. and make sure you go check that out. Uh, Mary, I appreciate you sharing today. Uh, it was really cool to kind of in a live setting, catch up with you as well. Uh, I yeah. appreciate you sharing at the end of the day, practical, actionable value and, and principles here that our listeners can go apply to their lives. Um, thanks both to you and, and shout out to Justin as well in the background. Yeah. Really appreciate <laughs> the right. opportunity to connect with you today. Thank you so much for having me.